Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Susan Brown, director of the Center for Better Bones, and I want to welcome everyone to our chat we're going to have basically for our Facebook community. You've been asking me a lot of questions about vitamin K. Vitamin K is extremely important in our Better Bones, Better Body program, so I want to take some time to answer your questions about vitamin K. You know, many years ago, the the people who were researching vitamin K actually came to my office to discuss this with me because I'd been, I'd been talking in my blogs and other publications about the importance of vitamin K. This was two decades ago before it was known very well. And we have been so impressed with vitamin K, MK7, vitamin K2. And as an anthropologist, I realized that just like we had much more magnesium, much more fiber, much more protein, much more everything in our early diets as we evolved, we certainly had much more vitamin K. So the important thing to remember that a, a substance is called a vitamin when you need it for life. It's the kind of thing if you don't take it, you die. And this substance we call vitamin K is a substance that is essential for life in that it allows for blood clotting. It's a kind of a technical thing how we would all bleed to death, bleed to death with any little cut if the blood didn't clot. So vitamin K activates certain enzymes, certain proteins that allow the body to do the clotting function to keep the blood stable. It has many other functions, but that's one of the main functions of vitamin K. It also works to activate other proteins, proteins, for example, that carboxylate osteocalcin. Osteocalcin is the uh, main bone protein produced by osteoblasts, those bone building cells, that actually stimulates the building of new bone. So vitamin K also works by signaling or activating this osteocalcin protein. And then we also know that it activates GLA matrix, another compound in the vessels that actually is a, one of the most important turnoff switches to arterial calcification. Did you ever wonder why do we calcify our teeth and our bones yet we don't calcify our arteries? One reason is because vitamin K is a signaling compound that helps to turn off this arterial calcification. There's many, many studies on the different forms of vitamin K, and maybe this is a, a good point to mention that, of course, there's K1, which is produced by plants. All the green plants produce K1, and that's where you can get a lot of K1. Um, K1 is sufficient to cause clotting, and it helps bone some, but nothing like the forms of vitamin K, which are the vitamin K2 forms. The distinct difference between K1 and K2 is a chemical difference. K1 is called phenylqualanine, and K2 are menoquinones. So vitamin K2 are produced by bacteria. So the plants produce vitamin K1. We eat the plants, we get that vitamin K. The animals in their guts in the, and the bacteria in the world when the, it produce vitamin K2. There's a couple of many forms of vitamin K2, actually, but the ones we pay most attention to, the ones that have been studied for, for bone, are MK7, which is menaquinone 7, and the 7 has to do with the, the chemical chain, menaquinone 7, which is a long chain vitamin K2, and then MK4, which is menatetranone, and that is another form of type 2 vitamin K. MK7 comes from food, fermented food, and this is where we get back to the bone health story. And I'm going to talk about MK4 in just a minute, but MK7 was discovered when they realized that Japanese populations in certain parts of the country ate a great deal of this fermented soy called natto. It's like tofu that's sitting around and got really rotten. It's a very slimy, very un... Well, to us, it's a very horrible taste. It's like the Limburger cheese of Japan. But they found that people who ate this regularly, they had much better bone health, much less fracture, and they had much less heart disease. So researchers started saying, why are these people better off? Why do they have stronger hearts and stronger bones? And they went back and found it was this MK7, this menaquinone 7, that the bacteria that fermented this soy product, which was called natto, this fermented, these bacteria produce this MK7. 
And then they went on to study. They said, well, let's see if we could isolate this MK7, if we could produce it through fermenting our fermenting different foods, will that help people? And it's, then they started out with supplementing with MK7. And they found that it actually tended to reduce the incidence of bone loss in menopause, for example. They found that it increased trabecular strength. You know, that spongy interior part of bone, that was increased. They found that overall there were many signs that there would be lower fracture incidence using this MK7, just like they had seen in Japan. And in fact, studies in Europe looked at people who got a lot of MK7 through their diet. Now in Europe, people don't eat natto, but they do eat a lot of true fermented cheese. Aged cheese has a lot of bacteria. That bacteria can produce MK7. And these people were found to have better bone health, less fracture. So that's MK7. Now I think the history was that researchers saw, wow, this MK7 food factor works great. Let's see if we can make a drug out of it. And this is when they went to MK4. Now, MK4 is another type of K2. You'll see it in some of the supplements today. But the thing you have to remember is MK4 has, it's one, it's usually synthetic that you buy today, and it's not a food factor, where MK7 is a food factor, a natural compound, and MK7 has a very long half-life. So you only have to take tiny amounts. The effective dose for bone is 200 micrograms of MK7, or 180 micrograms, the studies show, which is very similar to what the Japanese people have in their blood. A very, it gives a very similar level. MK7 has a very long half-life. You only have to take it once a day. It actually has a half-life of almost 72 hours. MK4 is a very short half-life, and it's much less powerful. You have to, when they developed this drug, this treatment for osteoporosis, they gave 15 milligrams three times a day. Now remember, with MK7, you're talking about 200 micrograms. There's 1,000 micrograms in one milligram. So they gave 15 milligrams three times a day, and they had to do it three times a day with the MK4 because it has a very short half-life, ending up for 45 milligrams a day, a very high dose of vitamin K, and we'll talk about, there was very, the Japanese have reported very interesting fracture reduction benefits. And remember, to do a fracture study is very expensive, so generally it's only the people that have a drug that are doing those studies. The Japanese did drug studies on fracture prevention with MK4. They saw very nice results, and we've published some of these on betterbones.com website. We believe that MK7 will be as effective at producing, reducing fracture, but there's been no long-term fracture studies simply because they're very expensive. You got MK4, you got MK7. They both help bone dramatically. MK7 is a natural form, small dose, food factor dose. It is a food factor. MK4, you will generally find in very small doses, except which they put together with some K1, some MK7, except if you get the equivalent of the Japanese drug therapy, which is 15 milligram tablets, you take three a day of the MK form, menatetranone. People often ask, should I, should I take all the vitamin Ks, for example? And so we know K1 is important, and we'd hope most people would get it from their fruits and vegetables. You know, there was an interesting study years ago, and they looked at a large, uh, large Framingham health study and the people that even ate lettuce once a day had less fractures. And that's because they were getting that vitamin K from the lettuce. The researchers suspect that was the reason. So K1 we want. We'd like to get it from our vegetables. Every multivitamin will have some amount of K1, maybe 1,000 micrograms. And that's a fine idea. K2 is not so common in our diet. It's very rare. MK7 can be fermented foods, as I mentioned. We suggest using the effective dose for bone, which is 180 micrograms. K, if you see a supplement that has MK7 in it, it's probably going to be small dose because MK7 is a bit expensive. And so to get 180 micrograms, you usually have to take that separately. You won't find it in a multiple. But you may find a little bit in a formula with K1. And then sometimes they put the MK4 in there. And it's true, all of these vitamin K complexes are good to take together. We generally rely on people getting the K1 and some of the MK4 in their multiple or their bone formula, and then we take MK7 separate because we want to get that effective dose of 180 micrograms. 
Just to talk about MK4 a second, I think it's an interesting drug therapy. Um, it's expensive. You have to take it three times a day. And remember, it has a very short half-life. So you have to take it three times a day. But sometimes you'll see a supplement says, oh, this is a mix of vitamin Ks, or we have this supplement with K1, maybe it says 1,000 micrograms, and then K2, and if you look carefully, it'll say it's MK4 or this menetetronome, and it, it will have a very small amount. It may have 1,000 micrograms or 1 milligram, 2 milligrams. They won't give you that therapeutic dose of 15 milligrams because, again, it's expensive and you only want to take it if you're looking to get that drug effect from that. So it is interesting when you, when you look at your multivitamin or you look at your vitamin K formula, try to see just how much K1 you're getting, how much MK7, and how much MK4 you're getting. And from the bone point of view and from the point of protecting from arterial calcification, which is another really important thing, is that vitamin K, particularly MK7, has been researched to be effective at preventing and in some cases even reversing arterial calcification. It's like, it's like you want to have those switches that turn off the calcification of the arteries really effective. You know coronary heart disease is the number one killer, and it has a lot to do with calcification of the arteries, which we always kind of blamed on cholesterol, but there's calcium deposits in there. So you want to take the effective dose, which is 180 micrograms of MK7. So always check your label, see just what you're getting in your vitamin K formula. So some people ask me, well, should I use MK4 or MK7? And we at the Center for Better Bones generally encourage everyone to take MK7 because MK7, one, is a food factor. Two, we can give it in the effective dose to both help build bone, reduce fracture, and also help prevent arterial calcification, which is 180 micrograms. And I think I have the researchers on MK7, have, the European researchers have actually come to visit us at the Center for Better Bone. They have spent a lot of time studying natto and how we can duplicate that effect amongst populations not eating natto. And I think it is, I think it is a superior natural form. Now, the MK4 you buy is going to be a synthetic because it's, it's a drug therapy that was developed in Japan. It's just that they can sell it in this country as a vitamin. It's not controlled as a drug. And so if occasionally I see a person who has a really wicked problem with fractures, they're fracturing the spine a lot, and they really are resistant, they don't want to use uh, the, the, the standard bone drugs we have, well, then I suggest go ahead and try the MK4, even though it's more expensive and you have to take it three times a day. But there's good data on it suggesting that it prevents fracture, particularly vertebral fractures. So occasionally we do recommend it. But for the average person, I like to use a food factor, MK7. And I think in the long run, it will be shown to be as effective. But as I've mentioned before, fracture studies are expensive. You only see them when there's a drug and somebody's going to make a lot of money off it. And there's been no fracture studies just yet on MK7. Okay. So sometimes people ask me about MK7, which is the form of vitamin K that we use here menaquinone. And the thing about it is that was originally produced, kind of, they discovered it in this traditional ancient Japanese food of fermented soy, like soy mix that is set to rot, actually. And it turns out this very slimy mix that the bacteria then produced this MK7. So when they first decided to produce MK7 for the world, they made it out of soy. And I will tell you, some people say, well, I'm worried I'm allergic to soy. There is really no soy antigen in there. It's quite highly processed. So I don't think the average person has to be concerned about that. But recently, they've started making MK7, particularly for the U.S., out of chickpea. So in other words, they have the same bacteria to ferment chickpea, and those chickpea, uh, the bacteria there produce MK7. So a lot of the vitamin MK7 you find in the U.S. now is made of chickpea. You can get it made from natto, but... I think they probably have, and I, and I actually have talked to the researchers working on this. Um, I'm in close contact with them because we think it's such an important nutrient, and, and they see the effect as the very same MK7 produced on chickpea and produ produced on uh, the soy. And so someone might push further and say, you know, I can't digest soy. Is it going to be a problem for me? 
Sure, just use it from chickpea, like the, like the vitamin MK7 we have at the Center for Better Bones is from chickpea. But uh, most people, there isn't enough antigen in that, in that refined. You're, they take out the MK7 vitamin. They don't take the whole chunk of soy and put it in there. But most of the, most of the chickpea you will, most of the MK7 you will find now is from chickpea. And if you don't digest any vitamin well, then you have to step back and figure, well, how can I enhance my just digestion? One of our plant-based friends who says she's plant-based and doesn't, and she's apparently plant-based and does not want to eat natto. We know natto, of course, is from soy, so that'd be good for plant-based people, but maybe she doesn't like the taste of natto, which most Westerners don't. So she wants to know what she could use to get the MK7. Uh, a lot of the MK7 comes from, it's produced by bacteria, so you find it in things like cheese, maybe sauerkraut, maybe a little yogurt. On betterbones.com, I've done a blog, several blogs on MK7. You can find the list of those foods, but they're pretty much a lot associated with animal things because they're bacteria that produce it, and not they don't produce it in plants. Um, the so that's pretty much that story. And this same person wondered, could K1, if you ate lots of K1, like lots of green vegetables, lots of vegetables, could that be converted to K2? You know, that's an interesting question. I have seen some research suggesting that maybe a degree of it can be converted, but I think you would have to take, if it's true, you'd have to take very high levels of K1, higher than you get in a plant-based diet. I'll try to look into that a bit more, but I would not depend on K1 converting to K2, that's for sure. So one question we have, a very particular question, a person says, I have 100 micrograms of vitamin K, and if I want to get 200 micrograms, should I take it all together or should I do it in divided doses? So if that is MK7 you're talking about, we know MK7 has a very long half-life. In fact, they have studied it to be effective up to 72 hours after you take it. So it really doesn't make any difference. You can just take that MK7 all at once. Um, and you remember, if you're talking about MK4, if you had 100 micrograms, it would be a tiny, tiny dose anyway. It wouldn't matter when you took it. But MK7, very long half-life, and you can take it all at once if you want, or you can do it in divided doses, but all at once is fine. We usually use one single capsule that has 180 micrograms. That's all you need in a day. I would remind you that I spent 30 years explaining and detailing the key bone building nutrients. We have identified 20 nutrients and you can find them all over my website, betterbones.com. You can call us, we'll mail you a list, we'll mail you a list with the name of the nutrient, the therapeutic dose, and actually how much the average American is getting, which is much less than the ideal dose. So things like zinc, boron, copper, manganese, 20 different nutrients are important to get right along with that MK7. You know, I do not believe they do. I do not believe it. it's a fat soluble vitamin. And so, so it's really good to take it with fats. You get a little bit better absorption. But as far as I know, I have not heard of any competition for absorption. And so I would just take it with a meal that had some, some fats in it. All of you are aware probably there's a new trend towards having healthy fats. I myself love ghee, I love almond butter, I eat my share of eggs. So I think just any average serving of fat like that is fine. You just don't want to be in a really like a, a totally no fat diet and think that you're going to absorb those fat soluble vitamins. You know, there's zillion little tiny areas that people haven't studied, but I don't think there's any problem in taking the vitamin K with calcium. I certainly take the vitamin K with my bone building formula. In fact, we put vitamin K right in the bone building formula for simplicity. So um, no, I don't think there's any problem at all. Now, people sometimes ask me about, well, vitamin K is fat-soluble, vitamin D is fat-soluble. Is there some rumor that these have to be in a certain ratio? Um, I think one way to look at that is vitamin D, one of its major jobs is to allow you to absorb calcium because your blood calcium has to be very stable or you die. So the body is very careful to have vitamin D always increasing calcium absorption. Now, 
And when you get too much calcium in the blood, then the body sends a signal, absorb less calcium. So vitamin D helps you absorb calcium. Now there are strange cases of vitamin D toxicity where someone gets like way, way too much vitamin D. It is enormously rare, but they absorb too much calcium. So their blood calcium gets high, the calcium in the urine, and they can actually do kidney damage to the, to the kidneys because of too much calcium calcifying the kidneys. Vitamin D helps you absorb calcium. Vitamin K helps you place calcium in the body. Vitamin K regulates the, the tacking of calcium to the bone. It's sort of like it, it activates the, it activates osteocalcin and it's also part of the glue that keeps calcium in the bone. And on the other hand, vitamin K also allows for the production of this factor, GLA matrix, that keeps you from calcifying the arteries. So vitamin D puts calcium in the, in the body, absorbs it. Vitamin K helps the distribution. Is there an exact ratio? Well, no, there can't be because I have clients that just need 1,000 milligrams of vitamin D. They're still going to need the 180 optimum level of MK7 if they want to try to maximize their bone health and protect their arteries. On the other hand, I have clients that need 10,000 vitamin D, and that doesn't really need me need to suggest that they need a lot more of this vitamin K. So while it's good to have to the vitamin D you dose on tier test, how much you need to get, say, a 50 or 60 level. The vitamin K, it's a pretty standard dose to be effective for osteoporosis and to help bone and to protect the arteries, about 180 micrograms of MK7. And you don't necessarily take more because you have higher levels of vitamin D. And of course, you want to keep your vitamin D, you know, 50, 60, you don't want to get over 100 on your vitamin D test because you can absorb too much calcium, but it's very rare. So I'd like to set aside the worry. One of, one of you, one of you in our great community has, has been all worried because you say, gee, I took vitamin D for a long time, fairly high levels. I got a 60 level in the blood, which is a good level. And I'm worried that since I didn't K, take K2, I did myself damage. Well, I wouldn't worry about that. It's not the taking of the vitamin D that gets you a 50 or 60 level in the blood that's going to cause any damage. To the contrary, it's very good for you. It's just that we now know that you can protect the arteries. Whether you take vitamin D or don't take vitamin D, you can protect the arteries with MK7 and you can help build bone better. You're not necessarily doing damage. Now, I have seen no research to the effect at all that you're doing damage if you take the, the vitamin D without the vitamin K. However, a smart person says, I know vitamin K is going to help place that vitamin D, place that calcium in the bone and not in the artery, and I know that it's going to help protect my health. It's the vitamin K has been shown to have anti-cancer effects, very interesting effects, anti-diabetic effects. And you think about it, as we evolved through millions of years, we ate a lot of fermented and rotten food. Before refrigerators, there was a lot of rotten food. And that bacteria is a great part of our body, and, and many times it's very helpful. So do not worry about that. Just be happy. Now we know that some small amount of vitamin K is a good idea, but it's, you're not going to be hurt taking vitamin D unless you were to take super high, unless you would become vitamin D toxic. In that case, even the vitamin K might not be such a big help. So as far as these combination formulas, many clients will come to me and I'll say, well, are you taking MK7? They say, yeah, yeah, I'm taking it. It's with my vitamin D. And so when you ask them, they might be getting 45 micrograms of MK7 with, say, 2,000 or 5,000 D. The problem is when you put those nutrients together, you can't get the appropriate dose. In other words, Everyone needs 180 micrograms of MK7. The vitamin D dose changes. Some people need 2,000, some people need 8,000, some people need 5,000. So if you put them together, it kind of complicates things. Now it is better to have even a small amount of MK7 than nothing, but if you're in the know, you want to get the therapeutic dose, which is 180 micrograms, so you want to separate your MK7 from the vitamin D. Along that same line, a client showed me this supplement. She said, this is my supplement or I mean one of our Facebook members, and she, she wants to know, is this good? She's got, she's got MK7, 100 micrograms. Okay, you all know that's a good start. We like 180, but that's a pretty good start. Then she's got MK4, menetetronome, which this form has miswritten, actually, as, um, 
the, this, whoever this is, this label is incorrect. So <laughs> you can call me about it. I'll tell you. But anyway, she's got MK, MK4, which, remember, MK4 is the drug therapy, very short half-life. The effective dose in the studies they've used is 15 milligrams three times a day. This has one... 1,300 milligrams. So it's one about one fourteenth of what you actually need. So it's a little smattering. It's okay. And then they have K1 uh, phenylqualanine, which is what we get from plants. And they have 1,000 micrograms, which is the standard dose of K1. So this is, you know, this formula is okay. It's got a few different types of the vitamin K in it. I What I don't like about it is it doesn't have the 180 micrograms of MK7, which is the dose that's been shown to be most effective in the clinical trials. So along that some, same line, one of our Facebook group asked, you know, well, sh I've heard that uh, I should take the vitamin D separate from my vitamin K. They're both fat-soluble vitamins, thinking that there'd be some sort of competition for absorption. Like I say, this is an amazing world. There's all kinds of research going on, but I haven't seen anything to that effect. In fact, if you think about it, I'm also an anthropologist. So what in nature, we did not sit and say, you know, I'm not going to eat this fish right now because I just ate this, you know, this piece of uh, buffalo liver. I mean, it's the body is very capable of handling those nutrients all at once. And certainly, I, I certainly take my vitamin K and my vitamin D together. I always try to take them with some amount of fat to get a little better absorption, but there's no need to try to separate those. There's a really interesting question about coagulation. In fact, if you ask about the safety of vitamin K, if you look even at the Linus Pauling Institute review, vitamin K is notoriously safe, except if people are on one particular type of blood thinner, which is Coumadin. Coumadin is actually an anti-K activity. It works by destroying vitamin K. If you take more vitamin K, your Coumadin is less effective. The new blood thinners are not affected by vitamin K, but if you're taking any blood thinner, ask your doctor, can I have vitamin K? Um, that's just a simple thing to do. This particular person was concerned about the possibility that she was worried that she might overclot with vitamin K. The basic, the way they discovered vitamin K, and they call it a vitamin because without it, some people will not clot. And you know, when babies are born, we give them a vitamin K shot right when they come out of the womb because we don't want them bleeding internally because the mothers are deficient in vitamin K, it seems to me, and, and our whole population is deficient, so they, they give these babies vitamin K. But you do not, you only turn on the clotting factor like once. It's not if you, so you turn on the clotting switch and you take more vitamin K, you don't turn it on again and again and over and over again. So you don't overclot with vitamin K. The only other situation is certain genetic disorders where people have certain clotting disorders. And again, if that's the case, you want to look carefully. I, there's a few websites that specialize in vitamin K that can help you sort out if you have a particular drug, and you can call our office if you have that concern or talk to your doctor, but it's only a rare few genetic disorders and using the blood thinner Coumadin that you really want to be careful with the vitamin K. Someone also asked, they have some calcification in other parts of their body. Like, you know, on this bone density scan, you can often see calcification of the artery. And you might have heard with breast tissue, the doctors will say you have calcification. Breast calcification is actually a warning sign for breast cancer. And you really want to work with those things. Now, this particular Facebook partner, a friend of ours, had calcification in the tendon. So will vitamin K help? You know, I don't know, but it certainly wouldn't do any hurt. But what I would really do for sure is I do an alkalizing diet because for some reason that, cal that calcium is like precipitating out and forming on the tendon. Now, it could be something about the footwear, who knows what, that irritated that tissue. But I would certainly do an alkaline diet, get my pH to 6.5 to 7.5. And remember, low pH means a lack of minerals and then do the, the MK7 180 micrograms. So one of our Facebook fans writes that she has this platelet disorder called ITP. That's a platelet disorder where you have low platelets and she wondered if vitamin K would help. And you know, it's interesting, I looked that up 
And even the uh, platelet association suggests that some nutrient therapies have found to be somewhat effective for many of the people who have this disorder, this genetic disorder of ATP. And they list vitamin K as one of those nutrients, and they list vitamin C, which is one of our favorite antioxidants, as another of those nutrients. So you can look it up with, a deficient, with the official ITP Support Association, but yeah, it seems like it's worth a, a certain percentage of the people noticed benefit in their platelet count when they took the vitamin K.